good. As, as you're all joining, please feel free to say hi through the chat pod. And before we start the session officially, I would like to go over some of the, um, um, the, the rules for the, the webinar. I think everybody knows by now uh, very well already, but uh, throughout the seminar or the webinar, please feel free to use the chat pod um, and, and the Q&A to, to ask your questions. Um, so the moderators, um, myself and, and Dr. Attila will be able to ask your questions to the speakers throughout the sessions. With that, um, it, it is such a big honor um, to, to have you all in this monthly IPOSC uh, co-organized webinar. Um, it is a special delight uh, to co-organize this particular webinar the, the first webinar of 2022 with the Turkish Ophthalmic Association, um, as I, I'm, I'm also, a, uh, which I'm also a, a mem honored to be a member of. We have amazing speakers. And uh, as always, uh, we're thankful to the AAO uh, for hosting uh, this webinar. And a special thanks goes to Michael um, and uh, Ray and, and Daniel Mummert. Um, behind the scenes, uh, Jason Yam, Sonal Farzavandi, and, and uh, Satya Gagulian has been working feverishly with Sehan Özkan in particular uh, to make this particular webinar happen. Um, so thank you. With that, I would like to go ahead um, with the introductions. Um, but first I would like to give a quick update on the IPOSC um, as, um, as a council, or um, as you know, we have 89 member societies, um, um, and we are representing more than 20,000 individuals under the IPOSC umbrella. Just wanted to acknowledge our founding president and, and, the, and the previous past presidents um, uh, of IPOSC. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sprunger is currently the, the current admin officer as well. They still have been uh, very, very um, um, really uh, uh, helping us with, with all the efforts. And, and, and the remaining of the board of directors, as you see, um, are, are listed. And, and, and we are delighted to have the advisory board uh, chaired by Mohammed Jafar and vice chair by Victoria Sheffield as well. And these are the advisory board members. As you know, we have several committees and I'm going to go through them maybe briefly um, as we have been very busy lately and, and maybe give you some update uh, on, on some of them. Um, as you know, the, the one of the most uh, busy committees have been the ROP committee and the overall committee chair is uh, Dr. Chen, but under the, the main umbrella, we have three subcommittees, the SIBA, uh, the International Classification of ROP, um, as well as the Online ROP Education Committees. Um, uh, the, the ROP classification, as you all know, have been published and, and there's going to be a presentation in the April, so please don't uh, forget to join that session as Dr. Chang is going to give further um, input in that. And as you know, 34 ophthalmologists have been contributing from six continents, um, amazing um, input and, and leadership. Uh, but here maybe um, j just to uh, shout out to the Turkish Ophthalmic Association that Şengil Özdek has, has been instrumental in this effort. So thank you for, for all for that. The SIPA committee has established the three centers of focus in, in Africa as, as planned, and they have been extremely busy. Um, and they have uh, finally, as you probably heard, um, that finalized the, the funding uh, for the first phase, and, and they have been uh, feverishly working on um, getting that up and running. The IPOS training and edu educational committee uh, is very busy with all the items that you're seeing and many more uh, and under the leadership of Jason Yam and, and the help of, uh, of uh, Dr. Sonal Farzabandi and, and Sati. Um, and the monthly webinars, um, and as this is the eighth one, uh, don't forget to visit us on the IPOSC YouTube channel to watch the previous webinars as, as we go. The vision screening and the iPad committee are the uh, probably the next big focus that, that we have been working on diligently in the last year in particular. The IPAT, the International uh, Pediatric Eye Care Team um, um, is, or training uh, committee, um, and the leaders, Stephen Christensen and Cindy uh, Pritchard, has actually currently right now are in Gambia, initiating, initiating our first orthoptic training site, and which we are going to hopefully this year, uh, going to start the six to 12 months of training and certification program which is going to be uh, the first of many to come. Um, so they have been working extremely diligent 
And I also want to acknowledge Muhammad Jafar in particular for all his support um, on, on these efforts as well. Um, and we, uh, the Vision Screening Committee has been very, very uh, busy as well. The leadership with Dr. Uh, Millicent Petersheim and, and also our very own um, moderator, Huban Attila, is going to be helping with the leading efforts too. And, and we're hoping to be partnered with, with APOS and the CEO of APOS for this international vision screening um, uh, committee efforts. Um, as the member of the, the general umbrella of IPOSC, uh, the TOA members um, are eligible to apply as volunteers for various committees, um, as well as all the council members, um, association, association members, um, associated members can, can join in our efforts. So please volunteer to our various committees. And with that, I would like to um, ask um, Puban to share um, her screen, if that's okay, as soon as I stop my, my screen here. Fantastic. And, and while Huban is unmuting herself as well and starting her presentation, I would like to um, um, introduce her. It is a distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Huban Attila, uh, our co-moderator, and, and she is the professor of ophthalmology and is the current director of pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus department and, and, um, and neuro-ophthalmology in Ankara University uh, Faculty of Medicine in Ankara. She is the head of department of ophthalmology um, as well as the, the president of Turkish Ophthalmological Association uh, Strabismological Society, uh, currently the secretary general and president-elect of the Turkish Ophthalmological Association and the Section Secretary of Neuro-Ophthalmology, Strabismus, Pediatric Ophthalmology and the European Association for Vision and Eye Research, the EVER. It is such a delight to, to, to have you with us, Huban, and, and um, making this happen. Um, the, the, uh, it's all yours now. Thank you, Farouk. Dear friends and colleagues, uh, as a traditional greeting, I will say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, depending on where you live around the world. Uh, as Farouk already introduced me, uh, I'm Huban Attila from Turkey, and I'm very honored and glad to be one of the moderators of today's webinar, Current Concepts in Strabismus and Andiopia. This webinar is co-organized by International Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Council and Turkish Ophthalmological Association. And it's hosted by American Academy of Ophthalmology. I would like to thank on behalf of my society and also for myself for uh, co-organizing, giving the opportunity for co-organizing this webinar. Uh, I'm also very happy to gather with you on screen and it's very great to have so many participants from all over the world. And uh, before starting, I would like to give a brief information about our Turkish Ophthalmological Association. Uh, Turkish Ophthalmological can, can Association you, uh... is the only society for ophthalmologists in Turkey. We have almost 5,000 members uh, and more than 200 honorary members. We have an active website and uh, we have many uh, lectures or seminars and meetings for uh, education and for uh, uh, giving of our members more support. And Huban, and, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you. I think we're still uh, stuck in the, uh, can we make sure that we're in the presentation mode so that- um, Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. I think there may be a little glitch. Oh, it's, is it okay now? And we're still in, in the, and uh, not in the presentation mode. I just wanted to make sure that you know that your slides are not advancing as, as they should. And let's click that one more time, maybe. Okay, we can do it that way too. Huh? So I apologize. At least uh, let's make sure that you're clicking one at okay a time. Now? At least we can see Is it in okay the bigger now? screen. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Turkish Ophthalmological Association is the only society for all ophthalmologists in Turkey, and we have almost 5,000 members. Uh, we have more than 200 honorary members, and we have an active website that we share the news and we can uh, have uh, communication with our members for their education, and uh, we almost more than half of the members use this website very actively. 
Uh, it's the Umbrella Society for Different Geographical Regional Branches and Subspecialty Societies. We have eight regional branches and all of them have their own boards. And also we have 15 subspecialty societies, again, with their own boards. All the branches and subspecialty sections can organize meetings and activities according to a schedule uh, coordinated by the uh, Turkish Ophthalmological Association and also by the financial coverage of the Umbrella Society. Uh, according to the regions, we have eight uh, branches and the largest one, as you may guess, is the uh, Istanbul one. It has more than uh, almost more than uh, one fourth of hold members. Again, and, if you can uh, advance your slide from the left side, maybe Huban, um, so that you know the, the slides are not advancing. And now, um, sorry. For... That's okay. I just want to make sure that everybody sees your visuals. Uh -huh. If you can click okay. on your uh, regional branches, maybe, and then subspecialty societies. And these are, sorry, these are the regional branches, uh, and and we have the we have fifteen subspecialty societies, and Servismus and Pediatric Ophthalmology is one of them. We have seventy four members, active members, and we have a board and. Uh, this is our uh, organization, this is our contribution for today's webinar. I know that our participants are looking forward to hearing uh, for our distinguished and outstanding speakers. So uh, to make, keep it uh, on time, I would like to leave the microphone to our first speaker, Dr. Michael Repka. I thank you, Huban. And this, thank you so much. And while uh, Mike is, uh, Dr. Repka is, is queuing his slides, and I would like to quickly introduce um, Dr. Repka, which does not need any introduction, but I'll do it anyhow. As you all know, he is the David Guyton um, and Peduniak Family Professor of Ophthalmology and Professor of Pediatrics in Wilmer Eye Institute, Johns Hopkins University. He's Chief Division of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Adult Strabismus, Vice Chair for Clinical Practice, Wilmer Eye Institute, past Chair of PEDIG, and also the past President of APOS, and currently the Medical Director of Government Affairs, American Academy of Ophthalmology. He has been a, a prolific member, member, maybe one of the most prolific members of the pediatric ophthalmology community. It's great to have you, Michael. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, th thanks, Farouk, um, and um, good day to all. Um, I was asked to update on pedic amblyopia treatment trials. So first off, uh, there was off-label use of these video games I also served as a medical monitor for luminopia, which has a recently FDA approved treatment of amblyopia and have some salary support as identified. So our objective is to review recent findings from PEDIG trials of amblyopia research. The excitement since patching and occlusion and fogging have been longstanding therapies is recognizing that monocular occlusion leaves a substantial substantial number of children with a sizable visual acuity deficit. They get better, but they don't get better as much as we would like. It also recognizes that amblyopia is a binocular problem in most patients rather than monocular, and thus could you identify a treatment that uses the binocular system to improve therapy? In most of the current approaches, children wear red, green, or polarized glasses over both eyes, or even more contemporaneously using a virtual reality headset. Uh, in most approaches, there is no patching and the treatment is anticipated, but not certain to be shorter per day. That goes on at the same time that computer games with binocular stimulation are exploding among the media and parents. So we have the professionals looking at it from one side, parents and the media promoting this binocular approach. Uh, most of the uncontrolled studies to date have shown a modest improvement, uh, and the treatments are generally not available outside of the research community in the past, although you can see marketing efforts now everywhere around the world. The genesis of mechanism for these treatments is to reduce or rebalance the contrast to the fellow eye uh, as an attempt to overcome suppression making the amblyopic eye have a better shot at seeing at the same time. 
Some approaches use moving masking of the fellow eye so that masks are covering up a portion of the visual field um, while the embryopic eye is seeing, or sometimes there is even complementary masking. Uh, that would not really be binocular in the traditional sense, and other methods use both of these at the same time. The other controversy in binocular activities is how should the content be delivered? Should it be passive, just watching a video, or active, trying to per perform a game? We don't know. The history in PDIG was our first attempt was using binocular Tetris or falling blocks uh, in which the child could see some of the circles with the amblyopic eye, some with the fellow eye, some with both eyes. The contrast in the fellow eye was turned way down and the patient played the, the game about 30 minutes per day. Um, we did a study, number 18, and involved two age cohorts in this study of binocular falling blocks, uh, 5 to 13 and 13 to 17. Recruitment was astoundingly quick. Parents wanted to try anything. Children were really excited about not having to do patching, uh, and they could do uh, the game. Um, amblyopia, pretty much of a wide range from strabismus and isometropy or both, but it had to be a relatively small angle that was part of the uh, eligibility. You did the treatment for 16 weeks, one hour per day of iPad or patching two hours per day. Um, and again, high contrast images to the amblyopic eye, reduced contrast to the fellow eye. The patient was actively engaged. The results were distinctly unexciting or disappointing might be the other way to put it. Um, in the younger portion of the children, you can see this plot over time, the binocular group in the, in the open boxes and the patching group with the squares and in the shaded boxes. And you can see the patching group, the comparison group did ever so slightly better. And the older age group, uh, again, the binocular group with the open circles, you can see that neither group really changed at all during the course of the therapy. What we learned, however, was that asking a child to do Tetris for 16 weeks, an hour a day, was simply not possible. It was too boring. Uh, the dropout, the utilization time was extraordinarily low. Uh, the data, though, here, for those that would like to see it, so 5 to 13, the adjusted difference of 0.3 lines favored patching in the younger cohort. And the, in the older age group, the adjusted difference of minus 2.7 letters, they actually all lost vision in that group of favored patching. But look at the completion. Only 13% did 75% or more of the scheduled time. This was just a non-starter. It wasn't fun. Um, a similar trial by a worldwide network um, the BRAVO trial did exactly the same sort of study of falling blocks design, varied contrast. The older age cohort, 36% compliance. So um, older children and preteens around the world simply have no interest in Tetris after a little while um, and no difference with placebo. So obviously that wasn't going to work. Um, a company, Ambliotech, brought a game to the market uh, called Dig Rush, in which it was a more typical video game format um, and had lots of marketing excitement back in 2015. Um, and so in this study, we looked at an older cohort, 7 to 13, and a younger cohort, 3 to 7. So we've moved down the age range to do this. And this is an active game, um, Ambliopia with anisometropia or strabismus, but the angle had to be small at the time. And of course, combined would be eligible. Again, a wide, a wide visual acuity range would be included. Uh, and you had to wear glasses for 16 weeks before eligibility or enrollment, and they didn't wear contact lenses. Now the, and the child had to be able to see the red diggers, obviously seen with one eye, and the blue carts in which the miners or diggers were placing uh, their raw material uh, when it was at 20% contrast. 
and you had to show you could do the game. 116 children were recruited in the older age group. Um, and we basically found that most of these children were treatment naive in terms of previous binocular treatment. 138 children were recruited, mean age of 9.6 years. You had to do the glasses plus the game five hours per week. Um, again, the results as we published about a year and a half ago were disappointing. The difference in this study compared to the Tetra study is this, game, this study compared it to glasses alone as the control, so not to patching. So this was more of a proof of concept study as opposed to a which is better study. Um, so the vision improved from baseline by 1.3 letters with binocular treatment and 1.7 letters with continued spectacles. Obviously, that was not what we had hoped to see. Uh, and no difference was seen at eight weeks um, as well. One of the other hopes with, stereo, with, with um, binocular treatment is improvement in stereoacuity. And neither group had an improvement in their stereoacuity at four or eight weeks. Three to six years of age range. Uh, these data are now in press at Optometry and Vision Science um, after December 9th of last year. So after four weeks, the mean visual acuity improved 1.1 lines with binocular treatment and 0.6 lines, which was both statistically and clinically felt to be significant uh, at four weeks of 0.5 line difference. So the children did improve of concern not sure how to interpret it and their varied interpretations. After eight weeks of therapy, the results became inconclusive. Um, there was 1.3 lines with binocular treatment, one line with spectacles. So if you will, the spectacle children improved, but more slowly. For the binocular group, 47% of children completed 75% of the treatment. So that was better than Tetris, but it really wasn't probably what we were hoping for in terms of compliance with just five hours a week. This game, even though it's active and has multiple levels, just wasn't enough to keep attention. Now, all of that sadly puts us in the place where binocular therapy is still of question. However, I wanted to call your attention to a non-PEDIC trial, one presented by David Hunter at APOS and uh, published in Ophthalmology this month, which used an act, a digital therapeutic using virtual reality goggles showing web content. And that using masking and some contrast reduction did show a clinically important difference of a line in visual acuity um, after 12 weeks of therapy. Uh, and that led actually to FDA approval of this product uh, this past October. So moving forward, way more research is needed on how to make binocular therapy uh, live up to its potential or hype. Uh, and we still need to find a way to reopen the critical period for vision development. And worldwide, one of the missions of IPOSC is to improve clinical care through vision screenings and improved access to eyeglasses for children everywhere. So much more to do here. Thanks very much. Yeah, Michael, a fantastic talk as always and great um, um, overview of what's going on right now. Um, maybe, is there anything PDIG is gearing up to do more or looking into these days? Um, we, we are in the process now of evaluating some of the yet newer platforms to see whether there are a treatment trial we need to do or whether frankly industry needs to do. I'm sure many of you are aware of Novartis's acquisition of Ambliotech a year ago, and probably some of the people on this call have been meeting with them to figure out what to do with that game to use as a treatment. Uh, others are aware of some uh, companies in Israel with similar products looking for a niche. So I'd say it's a wide open, or if you will, Farouk, a very American-centric comment, a wild west out there in terms of um, um, this space. So in your practice, I'm, I'm assuming you're, um, it's the, the classical treatments for you, the, the, the patching and, the, and, and penalization, and obviously giving glasses, getting rid of strabismus, 
um, um, and how is your algorithm in your clinic and, and what excites you these days and what do you think, uh, what are you more hopeful of in the, for the future? Um, I, to be honest, I think that contemporary treatments with patching and occlusion work, they work well and they're inexpensive. Um, so one of the things that none of this therapy has solved yet is the difference in cost. And you know that has to be part of the equation as we try and deliver this care uh, to everyone. Uh, there's a question, Dr. Epka. Uh, one of the participants asked about the transcranial stimulation. <laughs> so transcranial stimulation is one of the approaches touted to fix almost anything neurologically that is a problem. And I'd say it's another treatment that we just don't know enough about, but it shows that people are excited about trying to improve the brain and make it work better. And I'd say uh, we pay attention to it, but we also know that there are a lot of treatments that are tried and that ultimately fail. And uh, also another question, uh, any change in your patching daily practice after this binocular treatment papers? Any uh, recommendation or any favorable to near activities? So, well, near activities, um, near activities intuitively should have, should make vision better. Um, in a now ancient PEDIG trial, we found that that wasn't true. So sometimes intuition failed us. Um, no, I, right now I have no, the, 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 although the Luminopia product is FDA approved, it's actually not available. Some of the other products from Vivid Vision and some of the others, I just am not using at the moment. And the oral medications, levotopa, carbidopa, or other medications, any, any update on that, Michael? Um, well, we, we did a study of, um, as you know, there were trials of levodopa, relatively small, and in some cases showed a benefit, in other cases were, uh, we didn't know, um, at least our PEDIG trial did not find a benefit in children 13 to 17 in terms of using it, but we studied only residual amblyopia. That was, could we push the patients further with drug plus patching and didn't do that. As initial therapy, I really think there's essentially no clear data. Great, and with the sake of time, I think we're going to move on to the next speaker as Sehan is uh, gearing up her talk. Uh, please remember um, for everybody that uh, we will have the discussion continuing on the, on the chat pod and I encourage everybody um, to, to make their comments and maybe we can ask Dr. Repka to continue to answer through the, the chat pod as well. we'll and uh, our next speaker is uh, Seyhan Bahar Özkan from Turkey. Uh, you know all of her, uh, she doesn't need introduction, but uh, she's professor of ophthalmology and the previous director of pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus department in Adnan Menderes University in Aydın. And she's currently working in our private clinic in Aydın. She is the past president of European Strabismological Association and also past president of the International Strabismological Association and also National uh, Turkish Ophthalmological Association Strabismologic Society. And uh, she will share us her experience with the unusual congenital restrictions and how to handle this problem. Seyhan, we are listening. Thank you, Huban, for this very kind introduction. And do you see my slides in the presentation mode right now? Yes, we can see, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, dear moderators, dear colleagues, it's my distinct pleasure to participate this webinar, and I would like to thank the IPOS Administrative Council, especially Faruk Örge and Jason Yam, for uh, their effort for making this uh, meeting webinar possible. So, I'm going to talk about unusual congenital restrictions. So when we uh, look at the congenital restrictive problems, we see that there is an unclassified uh, form related to accessory extraocular muscles and bands, and these may be either isolated or in combination with other uh, congenital restrictive problems. So when we look at the incidence, there was a large study uh, that was published by Kitri and Diemer, and they demonstrated that in normal subjects, the incidence of these structures are 0.8%, 
And the, this incidence increases to 2.4% in strabismic patients. And in the ones who had CCDD problem, there's a, a striking increase as the per, uh, its incidence is nearly 42%. So in the literature, these structures are called as accessory muscles or supernumerary muscles or bands or anomalous orbital structures. So when we look at these surgical findings, many years ago, Goban reported that in Duane syndrome in a group of 67 patients, the incidence of uh, abnormal bands was 34%. And in a very recent report from Shenar uh, and Associates, they reported a higher incidence in a group of 31 patients with Duane syndrome. And the possible increase from 34 to 48% uh, is possibly due to the use of surgical microscope. So when we look at the uh, etiology, so these uh, structures may be an atavistic muscle, which represents muscular retractor bulby remnant, which is present in lower mammals. And they may also be extraocular muscle remnants, and they may be either with or without innervation. And they may also represent components of CCDD. So Luther uh, classified these structures in three forms as type one. Uh, and in this form, the, uh, these structures arise in the anterior portion and they ar arise from extraocular muscles and type two as distinct fibrotic bands beneath the extraocular muscles and as type three as discrete muscles originating in the posterior orbit. And in type two and three, it is easier to recognize those structures with MRI, whereas, whereas it is hard to demonstrate it on MRI, the, uh, the type one. And Luder reported the possible clinical signs as globe retraction in unusual gaze positions, very large vertical deviations and elevation deficit worse in abduction. And in our clinical practice, we've also found that unusual mot any motility pattern, any congenital motility pattern, synergistic vergences and unusual shoots on side gazes and significant Y or lambda pattern are also suggestive clinical signs about extraocular bands. And the surgical signs are any unexpected force action tests during surgery and a positive forced action test after disinsertion of the extraocular muscle and scleral fold sign or scleral indentation sign after severing the extraocular muscle. So here you see the scleral folds. As you can see here, this is the inferior rectus is disinserted. And on the right hand side, you see that after disinsertion of the inferior rectus muscle, you can see the plicates over the sclera which demonstrates a, a thick tissue in the posterior orbit pulling on the uh, sclera. So when we look at the functional and histopathological aspects, these accessory bands or muscles cause restrictions. And histopathologically, they may have fibrotic tissue, dense collagen fibers, or muscle fibers sometimes. And innervation is variable, and they may even show paradoxical contraction as we have previously demonstrated. So treatment is required if they cause a motility pattern. Sometimes they may have no problem. And uh, in, if we are going to treat them, then disinsertion or excision where possible is recommended. And if the location is in the posterior or globe, uh, they may not be reached and the outcome is unsatisfactory in posterior locations. So here you see the most straightforward type and this patient has a bilateral Duane syndrome. And you see that bilaterally after disinserting the medial rectus muscle, you see the tissue band behind the medial rectus muscle. And after severing this band, forced action test was positive. So this is another case. Again, this is a type two Duane syndrome with a vertical component. And after disinserting the lateral rectus muscle, you see the scleral indentation here. And the forced action test is positive despite this insertion. You see that there's a very small uh, translucent band and after uh, severing this forced action test became uh, negative. However, in this patient, there was a recurrent deviation and on the reoperation, we have seen that there was a reattachment at the insertion area of this uh, accessory band behind the lateral rectus muscle. So it, is, it should be preferred to excise these tissues instead of severing them. 
So this is another patient and she's characterized with an upshoot on AB duction in the left eye. So he, she underwent a kinematic MRI. There was nothing wrong in the horizontal rectus muscles and coronal MRI, kinematic MRI, that we have seen that the superior rectus muscle was demonstrating an, a paradoxical contraction on AB duction. However, on surgery, there was a positive force duction test as the, at the medial rectus area. So we have identified this abnormal tissue behind the medial rectus muscle and histopathological uh, examination revealed no muscle tissue inside. And the retrospective MRI uh, evaluation showed us this tissue actually on MRI, but it wasn't possible to make this comment before surgery. So this patient had a, a tissue band and running through levator palpebra and superior rectus muscle through the limbus. And you see the scleral indentation on the nearby the limbus and the histopathology revealed fibrosis and collagenized collective tissue and uh, surgical treatment was disappointing, disappointing at this patient. So this case has an upshoot on abduction in the right eye with limitation of depression. So he underwent a recess resect in the right eye with infra placement. And because of the positive force duction test, and we have found this medial rectus accessory muscle, and there was also accessory band uh, nearby the superior oblique muscle. And these were uh, excised. And this patient has a Y pattern deviation, which is accepted as an atypical form of DON syndrome. And on operation, we have found that in the, in the left eye, there was a tissue band, as you can see in the upper side. And after severing this, so this is the disinsertion of the first band, and we have identified a second one behind. So this was also severed, and this is after recession and supraplacement of lateral rectus muscle. This patient again has a Y pattern and in combination with a vertical Duane syndrome. So the MRI demonstrated an abnormal structure over the inferior rectus muscle. It wasn't possible to reach that tissue. And after recessing this inferior rectus muscle, both Y pattern and vertical retraction improved. This is another case who had a lambda pattern deviation. And when we look at MRI, we have seen that she had no inferior rectus muscles in both eyes. And she, instead, she had this abnormal structure be, below the optic nerve. And even more uh, interestingly, on kinematic MRI examination, this tissue was demonstrating a very clear contraction on down gaze. So this, which indicates that this was a muscle tissue and we have decided not to operate her. So this is another patient. She, he had left synergistic divergence and on the operation, we have seen the left accessory muscle. There was a partial muscle. And as you can see, after severing this and behind seven millimeters behind the insertion, we have identified the second lateral rectus muscle. So these two parts were joined and fixated to the periosteum and in combination with medial rectus resection. And you see the postoperative appearance of this patient. This is another case with vertical and horizontal divergence. And uh, this is the preoperative appearance. So she underwent uh, orbital MRI and we have found that he, she had hypoplasia of both medial rectus muscles and right inferior rectus and left superior rectus muscle and bilateral inferiorbic muscles. And during the operation, we have identified four accessory muscles in this patient. The first one was in the left lateral rectus muscle, and you can see the two parts. And the other was in right lateral rectus muscle, and this was excised. And in the right superior rectus area, there were two uh, accessory tissues, as you can see here, and these were severed. And this is her appearance after surgery, after recessions. So the take home messages are, consider accessory extraocular muscles and bands in unusual strabismus and ask for MRI in suspected cases and do the force action test uh, always in all patients and repeat it after this insertion. Check for scleral fold sign or scleral indentation sign. Scleral fold sign gives us uh, the impression of a larger tissue and scleral indentation sign is seen in thin bands. And excise instead of severing, there's a risk of reattachment. Accessory muscles may have paradoxical contraction. However, target tissue may be inaccessible. 
And I'd like to thank you for your attention with two uh, memory photographs from two previous meetings, the one in, in Izmir in ESA 2004, and the other is ISA 2010. And the next ISA meeting is going to be held in Cancun, Mexico, and the abstract submission is open. Thank you very much for your attention. Seyhan, thanks a lot for this fantastic, uh, unbelievable uh, presentation. Uh, do you suggest taking MRIs or uh, kinematic MRI in uh, abnormal eye movements or in every uh, CCDD patient? Do you have any suggestion for checking these or is there a sign or is there a symptom that you ask for MRI? So in straightforward cases, like um, typical forms of Duane, typical Browns and so on, uh, I don't ask for MRI, but in the atypical ones, and, and so with some bizarre problems, uh, with some strange motility things and this strange globe retraction, strange upshoot in side cases and so on, then I ask for MRI. And uh, if it is, uh, how should I say, if I'm looking uh, for uh, finding out the paradoxical contraction, which if I'm not sure with the clinical appearance, which muscle is demonstrating a paradoxical contraction, then I try to get a kinematic MRI, but kinematic MRI is really a very challenging technique. So, but I must say that by making the kinematic MRI, instead of seven points of fixation, if you do it with three points of fixation, the examination time shortens a lot, but you need to be in close uh, communication with the radiologist and you need to think about the patient and address the radiologist, the muscles to look for, because you cannot look for all muscles in a kinematic MRI. It's not possible because the patients cannot stand for it. Say, honey, but of course, heard. with all these detailed things, sometimes it's not possible to see the structures you can you may sometimes only find it during the uh, surgical procedure sorry Farouk. Yeah, that's okay i was going to say well um, and sorry for interrupting huban um it, it's just fascinating cases and obviously your practice is not a normal practice um i i, I think all over the um, uh, the region people probably are sending very tough cases to you uh, similar to the other panel members anyhow so um, I think there is this kind of a skew in that sense. But having said that, have you seen a pattern or a genetic pattern that um, certain regions, certain families, um, th 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 does this run in the family? Any gen genetic factor behind this, you think? Well, actually, I, I certainly consider this. Uh, but these patients, some of them had a, a family history. But well, among the patients that I've demonstrated to you, there is only one who had family history. The others were all sporadic cases. But uh, by means of a genetic background, well, actually I have a family of a bi-pattern deviation, nothing else, just bi-pattern, uh, the atypical form of Duane syndrome. And, uh, and I'm trying to make a genetic uh, study on, on this family, but I'm trying to collect them because they are in far cities and so on. So, but this is a very uh, interesting uh, area to look for, actually. Great. For, for the sake of time, maybe uh, we will uh, go to the next speaker, but just fascinating talks one after another. And there's so many questions that, that, that we have in mind and it's a, always a pleasure to, to have uh, you, Sehan. Um, and if I'm going to ask uh, Federico to, to start uploading his, uh, sharing his screen for his slides and allowing me to introduce um, um, my dear friend Federico. And um, Federico Velez is a Leonard Apt and Dow Chair in Pediatric Ophthalmology in UCLA, Los Angeles, California. He's Clinical Professor of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus in Stein and Doheny Eye Institutes, UCLA, Los Angeles, California. He's a Consulting Professor in Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus in Duke University, Durham, North Carolina. He's an Associate Editor of the Journal of APOS and currently the Chair of uh, the Adult Strabismus Committee for APOS. He travels quite a bit going back and forth between the, uh, the facilities. It's great to have you, Federico. Okay, good morning. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we can, and we can see okay. your screen. Okay, great. So I wanna thank you, IPOS and the Turkish Ophthalmology Association for this kind invitation. 
And um, these are my disclosures. They're not relevant to this presentation. And I just want to present a typical case that I will consider uh, the topic of compartmental strabismus as a very helpful tool in treating patients with uh, large incomitants, uh, vertical and horizontal misalignment, like this uh, young baseball player. So let's talk a little bit about compartmentalization. Uh, this is actually something that was introduced a long time ago, 1961, Butter, and 1970 by Beatty. Uh, basically, uh, selective segmental innervation in pattern strabismus. It's been popularized by uh, Joseph Dimmer at UCLA um, with the knowledge that muscles uh, split longitudinally. Uh, their motor units, basically the trunk of the extra, um, the cranial nerves split uh, before penetrating the orbit. And then there is selective innervation. And the most important one probably is the lateral rectus muscle because it has the highest um, degree of compartmentalization where the six nerve bifurcates posterior to the orbit and innervate the upper and lower compartments. Only a minor percentage, less than 5% of fibers on the lateral rectus muscle share uh, innervation. And the medial rectus muscle is also well um, defined, but not as well as the lateral rectus muscle. The inferior rectus muscle has a very interesting uh, uh, anatomy. Uh, one paper suggested that the lateral portion of the inferior rectus has a selective innervation, uh, but I believe most of the papers uh, suggest that there is an innervation to most of the inferior rectus except the medial portion that actually has a selective innervation. And the superior rectus muscle just have a very mixed um, compartmentalization. There's really no pattern. For the superior oblique, uh, Probably we knew very well the anatomy on the superior oblique when we were talking about anterior torsional fibers and posterior torsional fibers, but the studies by Timmer demonstrated actually that there's really a very well-defined independent innervation for the posterior lateral fibers that have to do with vertical movements and the anterior torsional medial fibers. Um, they're independent and there's just a mix uh, of less than 7%. I think this is important uh, when we look at patients with superior oblique palsies, because we, we actually can see patients with excellent vertical movements and a lot of torsional uh, mis innervation. And we see patients with the other pattern where the vertical component is the main reason of complaint, but the patient fuse very well when you put them on prism. So torsion is really not important. And there are several studies that actually came mostly from South Korea, where they demonstrated hypoplasia of the cranial nerve four in patients with superior oblique palsy. So I think it goes along with this uh, concept. Ocular motility. So um, this is based on MRI. So we don't have really good studies or no studies demonstrated differential forces on the compartment. But I just want to um, summarize what is being um, found using MRI scans. And basically, this table demonstrates that if you are adducting, the superior compartment of the medial rectus muscle is contracting more than the inferior compartment. But the lateral rectal muscle is relaxating um, a, in full and is symmetrical. And what is the importance of this? Perhaps that when we talk about herring's law, it's not really the entire lateral rectus and the medial rectus muscle that are um, working together simultaneously in the same amount of contraction or uh, relaxation. Uh, in conjugated ductions, uh, again, the medial rectus superior compartment contracts more than the lateral rectus superior compartment but the inferior compartment of the medial rectus is actually contracting the same amount of the entire lateral rectus muscle. For vertical, I just wanna mention the inferior rectus muscle, and this has to do with this uh, innervation of the medial compartment that seems to be um, isolated and uh, not shared with the rest of the inferior rectus muscle. As you can see, the medial compartment increases more uh, than the lateral compartment in down gaze. And they both relax similarly when the patient is looking in up gaze. So surgical techniques. Again, going back in history, uh, the big theories started with bone graphics in Beery and basically how to manage B patterns and A patterns. And if you look at this uh, table again, the inferior pole of the lateral rectal muscle will recess more than the superior pole to treat exotropias. But if you look at Beery's um, surgical approaches, actually it did pretty much the opposite. 
So with this to be said and summarized is really, there's not really a good consensus of what you need to do when you're man managing A or B patterns by slanting the horizontal rectus muscles. Alan Scott, um, and we all, you know, give a lot of uh, respect to him since he just passed away a few months ago, a few weeks ago. I was the first person I have knowledge uh, that introduced this concept of marginal tenotomies of the horizontal rectal muscles to manage horizontal dextrabismus, which also is used for vertical misalignment. So he was basically cutting the muscles, not really looking into the upper or the inferior pole or the medial or the lateral poles to manage. He was just cutting the muscle fibers until the patient identified single vision in the primary position. But we all know that actually these procedures can be selective. And this actually is from a paper from Michigan where they actually found that there is about 1.5 prism diopters correction per millimeter of tenotomy when you do it selective either temporal or nasal in the vertical rectus muscle. Mini plications, the concept was introduced at least to me by uh, Lenhart and Wright and doing central plication of the extraocular muscles. However, these plications can be actually performed selectively, nasal or temporal, superior or inferior, to correct not only torsion, but also to correct vertical misalignment. So that's what I call selective marginal plication. And these selective marginal plications are very helpful as I'm gonna present in a few minutes. This concept of compartmental sixth nerve palsy was introduced again by Deemer and um, Matt Fieldman, who is in Pittsburgh, and Deemer did a paper where they actually look at patients with unilateral sixth nerve palsies who have vertical misalignment. And they actually found that it's quite often to have hypertropias and hypotropias. And if you look at this imaging, you can see that the lateral rectus muscle has a segmental hypertrophy. The upper compartment of the lateral rectus muscle is very atrophic or hypoplastic compared to the inferior compartment. However, this paper failed to prove that there was actually a correlation in 100% of the patients when the upper or the lower compartments were atrophic to have the same uh, kind of hypertropia or hypotropia. What about incomitant vertical and torsional strabismus? So this actually graph is published. Um, my uh, goal is not to present the graph and discuss it in detail, but I wanna say that uh, ver incomitant vertical strabismus can be actually corrected by operating on the vertical rectus muscles, doing selective temporal or nasal tenotomies, marginal tenotomies, up to 90%, and the correction is about 10 prism diopters. And you should select, depending on the, the deviation is worse. You can either do plications or you can do recessions if you prefer to do one or the other. For torsional estrabismus, the same concept can apply to correct excyclotorsions or incyclotorsions with about seven degree of correction. Um, it actually uh, correct more in patients that have uh, previous uh, strabismus surgeries. This concept of superior rectus and lateral rectus band is very popular now because people refer to Saginaw syndrome. However, I just, I'm not gonna refer to Saginaw syndrome here uh, as such. I just wanna refer to these findings because I found interesting why patients when the lateral rectus displays inferiorly become isotropic. And we believe that is because the lateral rectus muscle is losing some of the torque. But I feel like this lateral band is keeping also one more thing is the tension of the temporal fibers of the superior rectus and the upper fibers of the lateral rectus. When this happens, of course, the superior rectus muscle is displaced nasally, which also creates isotropia. But not only that, the nasal transposition of the superior rectus muscle decrease the torsional action. So these patients actually can end having exact rotation. And that's what happens in patients when they have Saginaw syndrome or heavy eye syndrome. We actually found out that vertical misalignment is very common in patients with Saginaw syndrome. And what is really interesting is that there is a subgroup of patients as is presented on this uh, graph that need to have vertical correction. And those are patients that have deviations as small as 2.1, uh, 2.3 prism diopters. So most of the patients that can fuse very small deviations do not need to have vertical correction. But if you have a patient that has in, uh, is unable to fuse on free, free space prism, I highly suggest you consider doing a selective 
plication or a selective marginal tenotomy on the vertical rectal muscle that you feel will correct more depending on the incomitance. If there's no incomitance, then you can do a central uh, procedure. Excyclotropia can also be corrected as is being presented. And this is actually the result of correcting this vertical misalignment in those patients that were diagnosed with Saginai syndrome by doing selective vertical rectal muscle procedures. Convergence insufficiency. So convergence insufficiency is really interesting because there's a lot of studies mostly coming from Asia demonstrated that slanting procedures can actually decrease the near distance disparity. So I want to refer to this paper by Sean et al. that has been published in 2015, where they actually found that uh, for each millimeter slanting between the superior and the inferior pole on the lateral rectus, there was a mean correction of about 8.7 prism diopters. We applied this concept to a small series of patients that were published, and I basically used what I call this algorithm based on the near and the distance deviation, because there are patients who actually have a negative force duction test, they have limited A deduction, but they really don't have any deviation at distance. And in those patients, I prefer to operate the inferior fibers of the medial rectus muscles. Other than that, I rather operate on the lateral rectus and depending on the amount of deviation in the primary position, I only do an inferior slanting procedure or I actually do a recession plus an slanting procedure. And in our hands, actually, this procedure worked quite well with a decrease of distance near disparity, uh, very significant from 13.1 to 5.6 prism diopters, decreasing the near deviation from 22 to 1. But what is really interesting is that these patients, in general, do not develop isotropias at distance or in lateral gazes. And finally, excyclotropia, just to mention one procedure, is just an anterior talk. Why to do anterior talks? Because the same way we can do anterior talks, we can do posterior talks. And we can do this because we know that the superior oblique muscle is selectively innervated by a medial anterior uh, innervation to the torsional fibers or a more lateral posterior innervation to the vertical fibers. So in summary, we don't know really the muscle force. So when we're talking about compartmental estrabismus, we're basing these on our surgical results and MRIs or imaging. But I think more selective procedures can be implemented to manage near distance disparities, incomitant vertical and torsional estrabismus, and of course, A and B patterns, as it was suggested back in the 60s and the 70s. I wanna thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to uh, respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Great talk, as always, Federico. Uh, uh, so so much to discuss, so little time to go over everything. Um, but I want to maybe uh, get back to uh, one of the questions that came from the Q&A. And um, how much do you think the compartmentalization is involved in divergence excess XT? This can justify specific surgery for the uh, two halves of the lateral rectus muscle is the question. For divergence excess, I'm not sure. Um, I, I will say that I have used probably the concept uh, more often in patients with uh, convergence insufficiency. However, I feel that patients that have um, high ACA ratio can probably manage similarly by using compartmental strabismus surgery. Um, I think the concept of the Y splitting, which I have done very few cases, but the concept of a Y splitting um, and I, I know there are people with much more experience than me to treat, for example, high ACA ratio or some incomitants may also have um, some issues with compartments by uh, decreasing the torque of the muscle. But I cannot comment on divergence excess exotropia. And for the sake of time, it seems like we need to go to the next speaker, but uh, please continue to have the discussions and Q and A's going with the Q&A pod, and uh, we have lively discussion there already. Uh, Federico, thank you so much. And now our next speaker is Dr. Denis Sommer from Ankara. She is professor of ophthalmology in uh, University of Health Sciences, Ankara Education and Research Hospital. And also she is the director of Strabismus and Pediatric Ophthalmology section. And today she will talk about what does evaluation of accommodation tell us? Okay, Denis. We are listening to you. 
not able to move on, sorry. Could you click on the presentation and then go on? No. And you can you can use the arrows on the left the bottom of the screen also. There we oh, go. Thank you. No. No, again, not. I'm sorry. Uh, you can use the uh, arrows on the left bottom of the uh, screen. Could give, yeah, could you give me a moment, please? Yes, here we are. I'm sorry for the delay. Um, sir and Mrs. Moderator, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about what does accommodation tell us about hypropia, isotropia development and emetropization. Accommodative behavior can predict which, or, which orthotropic high hypropic infants can be observed without spectacles and are not at risk for developing isotropia and which are at risk. When the clinician is confronted with an orthotropic infant with high hyperopia, the decision as to whether or not to prescribe glasses, and if so, how much hyperopia to correct is not straightforward. The dilemma is that on one hand, prescribing glasses might in theory prevent the development of infantile accommodative isotropia, and or amblyopia, and on the other hand, there is theoretical concern that prescribing full or even partial hypropic correction may prevent emetropization. Concern is further compounded by the fact that not all infants with high hyperopia develop isotropia. These concerns raise questions yet to be answered. Do hyperopic children really need the provision of full plus refractive correction to meet these objectives? And is there a test that can predict which infants will go on to develop isotropia and which will not? One possible explanation lies in the differences in uh, infants' accommodation behavior. If an orthotropic infant with high hyperopia is simply not accommodating fully, it might be at risk for developing isotropia when the infant becomes more visually interested and starts fully accommodating. Because dynamic retinoscopy is a simple office based test for accommodative ability, it is an ideal tool for testing binocular accommodative ability. We conducted a study where we, um, where we, uh, where we uh, have taken babies under one year of age and over five diopters refractive error correction without treatment or with partial hyperopic corrections according to their accommodative abilities. At birth, the infant eye is hyperopic. In order to focus the images onto the retina, the baby needs to accommodate. If accommodation is full, there's evidence that the baby is able to focus images onto the retina while maintaining binocular vision at near. Regardless of their refractive error at far, all people are myopic at near as they accommodate. If accommodation is full, there will be neutral or myopic response with dynamic retinoscopy on the two corresponding less hyperopic meridians, uh, the vertical meridians in this example. Dynamic retinoscopy is performed before cycloplasia and the retinoscope reflects in the vertical and horizontal corresponding meridians are assessed. If there's normal dynamic retinoscopy response, the corresponding fixing meridians would have neutral responses and the corresponding non-fixing meridians would have either neutral or hyperopic with motion responses. If there's dynamic uh, an abnormal dynamic retinoscopy response, there will be hyperopic responses in the two corresponding meridians or a hyperopic response in one and uh, a neutral response in the other eye. Infants who were followed uh, with, uh, with initial normal accommodation and were followed without spectacle, uh, were followed, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not able to see some of the slides myself, that's why I'm a bit slow in presentation. Uh, infants who showed 
normal dynamic retinoscopy responses were followed without spectacles. In theory, if an orthotropic infant with high hyperopia is accommodating fully, the baby is able to focus images onto the retina while maintaining binocular vision at near. So in theory, there was no need for partial or full hyperopic correction and no risk for developing isotropia. The infants showing an abnormal accommodative response were put in spectacles, but only incorporating the least partial hyperopic correction needed to neutralize the width motion and change it to neutral response. Because if any orthotropic infant with high hyperopia is simply not accommodating fully, it might be at risk for developing isotropia. All orthotropic infants, despite high hyperopia, uh, that showed good accommodation on dynamic retinoscopy and followed without glasses, had normal visual acuities and three, at three and a half years of age and non developed strabismus. Only infants that showed initial deficient accommodation uh, developed isotropia, and nearly half of these patients developed isotropia. In case of accommodation failure, there is almost 50% of isotropia development. Uh, so at least partial uh, hyperopic correction that allows full binocular accommodative response for near should be prescribed. The infants with initial abnormal responses and partial corrections who did not develop strabismus also had normal visual acuities as three and a half years of age, and these spectacles did not impede ametropization. My second talk will be on uh, the accommodation, what accommodation tells us in exotropia. A decrease in accommodative response could be a contributing factor on the outcome of basic exotropia surgery. We ev evaluated the state and symmetry of accommodative response in the two eyes of patients undergoing operation. Investigation revealed a constant reduction of accommodative response in the non-dominant eye in 68% of cases. So there would be normal response in the dominant eye and a hyperopic response in the non-dominant eye. And the, in the remaining 32% of cases, there was normal accommodative response. If there is a constant reduction of accommodative responsiveness, uh, in the non-dominant eye, accommodation as a stimulus for convergence does not work well, and there is inadequate convergence input, so uh, there will be no beneficial effect of convergence to control exotropia in the non-dominant eye. Both groups received unilateral recessive sex procedures or symmetric lateral rectus recessions. Among patients with preoperative unilateral reduction of accommodative responsiveness, the result of recessory sex surgery was significantly better than that obtained with bilateral lateral rectus recessions. Among patients with normal preoperative accommodative response, equally satisfactory results were obtained using these two uh, different approaches. So in patients with basic exotropia who do not have the beneficial effect of adequate convergence, uh, a recessory sex procedure seems to work better. The relative difference in success may be due to the benefit gained from resection procedure, which tends to tether the eye against abduction and guard against a later exotropic drift. Lastly, I'd like to talk about uh, the accommodative uh, role in reduction of hyperopic correction. We sometimes wonder why patients with stable uh, with accommodative isotropia failed to tolerate reduction in their spectacle corrections. We conducted a study where hyperopic correction of children with baseline refractive errors 1.5 to 5 diopters were gradually reduced in all five diopter increments. Patients began to experience difficulty for near vision when a, approximately two diopters was, uh, reduction was achieved among patients with lower than three diopters, and an approximately one diopter of reduction was achieved among patients with more than three diopters of hyperopia. The discomfort was associated with bilateral leg of accommodation. Uh, 
In order to focus an object at 25 centimeters, the emetropic eye must accommodate by four diopters. And for a, a comfortable near vision, one third of the available accommodation must be left in reserve. With a reduction, uh, when a reduction of two diopters is accomplished, a child would still need four diopters of accommodation to see clearly at near and plus need a reserve accommodation to have a comfortable near vision. At seven years, orthotropic and metropic children have 13 diopters of accommodative amplitudes. We tried to investigate whether the same amount applied for a child with accommodative isotropia. If discomfort begins at these diopteric reductions, discomfort could be uh, could have happened due to the removal of reserve accommodation for comfortable vision. For a seven-year-old child with accommodative isotropia, the accommodative range can be uh, in the uh, among a range of five to six and a half diopters, much smaller than the accommodative amplitude of a seven-year-old normal child, which is approximately 13 diopters. The reduction in the total amount of available uh, accommodation could explain why patients with accommodative isotropia fail to tolerate further reductions in their spectacle corrections after a certain amount of decline has been accomplished. Thank you. Dennis, thank you for this fantastic talk. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, is there a uh, certain amount of hyperopia in cycloplegic refraction that is, uh, that's correlated with the dynamic retinoscopy? I mean, if, uh, if you have like four diopters of hyperopia, Will it affect dynamic retinoscopy or is it independent? Uh, I'm afraid we cannot tell an amount where the dynamic retinoscopy data will be hyperopic. Uh, we examined that uh, until seven diopters refractive uh, figure, the patients could have normal accommodative, uh, normal accommodation. So we have to perform uh, cycloplasia in every patient, whether the dynamic retinoscopy is a myopic response or a hyperopic response. Then it's such a phenomenal talk and so many pearls for, for all the clinicians. And, and again, as a reminder, as you well underline that it, every one of us should be doing dynamic retinoscopy in every patient that um, really will, will make us understand what the dynamics are. And my question is, and there are a lot of questions comes in mind, and um, do you ever titer uh, the amount of surgery that you do um, um, for ET or XT, depending on what you see in a dynamic retinoscopy? No, we don't. <laughs> it's, just, it's a quick answer. But okay. okay. And, and have you ever seen, or do you have a trend that you see in kids um, on how the, um, the, the briskness or the amplitude has has uh, changed over years. Um, uh, can you predict that almost in a kid or is it very difficult? Is it very individualized? Um, it's, it's very difficult for a kid, uh, yeah. but uh, we use MEM method, MEM method uh, to, for example, uh, decide on, an, on a hyperopic spectacle for an exotropic patient, let's say. So we don't uh, usually take a minus two from the prescription, but decide the decline from the dynamic retinoscopy data. So we have to uh, consider an amount that enables accommodation and so convergence. Otherwise it would be, a, uh, it would be wrong to cancel, I mean, to decline a certain amount from a high hyperopic exotropic child. Well, thank you so much. And again, uh, there are questions coming up with the Q&A and, and uh, well, the discussion will be further than that. Um, and, and thank you for queuing your talk already, uh, Steve, as, as doing the preemptively uh, to save time. Um, it is my pleasure to now introduce Stephen Kraft, um, a staff ophthalmologist department of ophthalmology and vision sciences, the Hospital for Sick Children and University Health Network in Toronto, Canada. Uh, professor of Ophthalmology and Temerity Faculty of Medicine, University of Toronto, again in Canada, and member of Executive Council and Chair of uh, Awards Committee of International Strabismological Association. Um, and while Steve is, um, um, is a mentor for, for all of us, and, and it's always great to have you, Steve. Thank you.
Well, thank you, uh, Farouk, and uh, hello to all my colleagues around the world. Um, thank you to the uh, IPOSC and TOA for um, asking me to, uh, <clears throat> to join this uh, webinar. And uh, our Turkish uh, colleagues uh, asked me to uh, discuss um, the in-torsion uh, traction test for the inferior oblique. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, one of our recent fellows, Alan Connor, uh, who's currently practicing in the United Kingdom, uh, who uh, helped me to put this uh, work together. Uh, we don't have any financial interests or conflicts of interest to disclose, but as, all, but as always, uh, I do declare a uh, strong clinical interest uh, in these uh, matters. Um, as far as uh, surgery on the inferior oblique, it's most important to be able to isolate and identify the muscle, of course, as in any surgical procedure, uh, because you have to identify the entire muscle to be sure that you haven't missed uh, any part of the muscle or a second belly. So when you capture the muscle, as you'll see here in this um, slide here, it's often uh, helpful to reflect into the tissues behind the muscle and to look for the vortex vein, which is an anatomic marker to indicate that you've obtained the entire muscle. But sometimes you don't see the vortex vein and, and um, we have maneuvers to try and determine whether we've captured the entire muscle to make sure we haven't left any behind. Uh, I just want to cite this first case of a patient with a right superior oblique palsy who was referred to our center uh, by a pediatric ophthalmologist who had done a previous inferior oblique recession on the right eye. And within two months, the, the overaction of the inferior oblique recurred. When we went back to look at the muscle at surgery, we found the recessed portion of the muscle, which we have here. And then a little bit further back, we found a second belly which is shown here on the right side. This is a separate clean belly, which was further back in the tissues. And this had been missed in the original uh, surgery. A number of years ago, uh, one of my uh, former residents and fellows and I did an anatomic study to look at the frequency of multiple bellies in the inferior oblique muscle. And we found that up to 10% of inferior oblique muscles can have more than one belly. And we've found both in surgery and in this anatomic study that you can have three bellies, in fact. And uh, here is one of our anatomic specimens showing clearly at a, in a cadaver uh, that there are two separate bellies in this muscle. We did a subsequent study looking uh, clinically if we could predict ahead of time um, what um, chance there was of having more than one belly. It turns out that there were no preoperative clinical parameters that could determine uh, conclusively whether or not you would find one or two bellies. And so over the years, people have described tests at the time of surgery to try and determine whether we've left any uh, component of the muscle behind. One of the earliest uh, reports was by David Guyton, who reported a method of what he called the exaggerated traction test, uh, which he graded subjectively from mild to very tight. And it was also a paradigm used by Coates and Pacey in another study several years later. And essentially in this um, uh, method, the eye is translated posteriorly. This is one of the important uh, aspects of this method where the uh, eye is actually translated into the orbit to put the muscle on stretch and the test is done in that position. Others have described other variations of uh, traction tests. Uh, Burton Kushner described a rotary passive duction where he rotated the globe clockwise and counterclockwise. This is again a qualitative method. And similarly, uh, the, the, and this was done actually with no translation of the globe. Uh, Jonathan Holmes, when he was still at the Mayo Clinic, uh, presented an alternative using the same method, uh, but using a Mendez ring to actually quantitate the amount of torsion. Again, this was done uh, without any um, uh, translation of the globe, but simply rotation of the globe and measuring the amount of freedom. 
And what uh, he described was that uh, you have up to 30 degrees of torsion, both for intorsion or extorsion to test the tightness of the inferior and superior obliques. And after you disinsert the inferior oblique, uh, the degrees of change are up to about 30 degrees or one clock hour. A further method uh, was that described by Irene Ludwig where she actually proptose the eye, that's actually drawing the eye out of the socket. The problem with that, uh, in my opinion, is that you are putting the muscle on lax, uh, it's, it's much more lax, and uh, for me, that would be less uh, sensitive in terms of trying to determine the tightness of the muscle at surgery. And uh, not unexpectedly, she found more freedom. Uh, there were more degrees of torsion that you could induce if you pulled the eye out of the socket. So our method, which I've used for over 30 years now, is kind of a blend of the best of these different methods. So instead of tightness of the muscle, I've described what we call an intorsion freedom, which is the number of clock hours of freedom when you retropulse the globe into the socket. So I use uh, David Guyton's method of transposing the, the translating the, the eye into the socket and putting the oblique muscles on stretch. So here is the method starting um, at the beginning of surgery before myectomy this is the surgeon's view of the right eye. And I grab at nine and three o'clock, retropulse the globe into the socket. And then you rotate the globe until you have the end of the freedom that you can feel. And it's surprisingly consistent among observers when you do this and measure the change in the uh, torsion freedom, you can see that you have to the half clock hour, about 1.5 clock hours of freedom. And again, this is fairly reproducible among different surgeons. This is done after the myectomy, again, grabbing at three and nine o'clock, retropulsing the globe. And now you can actually rotate the globe three clock hours, 3.0 clock hours. And so you've had a change of the intorsion freedom of 1.5 clock hours. We looked uh, in the study at uh, all of our inferably myectomies over a 10 year period and reported the change in intorsion freedom before and after the surgery. We had four study questions. First of all, does the intorsion freedom correlate with your subjective uh, um, assignment of the overaction degree of the muscle? Does the untorsion freedom of eyes with inferably overaction, how does it compare to control eyes with no strabismus issues? How much does it change after myectomy? And most importantly, can the test be used to diagnose an incomplete myectomy or the presence of a second belly? For the first question, does the freedom correlate with the overaction? And uh, we looked at 56 myectomy patients and 25 normal controls without any strabismus disorders. And just for reference, these are the gradings that uh, I use from zero to plus one, plus two, plus three, and extreme plus four. And our study showed that with increasing inferably overaction, you have a progressively decreasing intorsion freedom, meaning that the muscle is stiffer the greater the preoperative overaction grading. Looking at in a slightly different way, there's a, a decreasing correlation here, such that the more the inferably overaction, there is a fairly linear reduction in intorsion freedom with a significant P value. Our second question is how does intorsion freedom in general in overacting inferior obliques compare to, to uh, control eyes. So we found that among myectomy patients at the beginning of surgery, the average freedom was 1.61 hours of intorsion freedom compared to controls that had much more freedom of 1.96 hours, indicating that myectomy muscles, uh, the ones that were overacting in general are stiffer than normal muscles. Now, once you do the myectomy, what is the change in the intorsion freedom? And we found that the, at the beginning of surgery, there was between one and 2.5 clock hours of freedom. 
which increased after myectomy. But looking at each of the cases individually, among all the 56 cases, the average change in freedom among all these eyes was 1.30 clock hours with a minimum of at least one clock hour of freedom uh, in the cases that were myectomized. That means that if you are going to do a myectomy and you are testing this, these patients uh, using this traction test, you should expect at least one hour of freedom after your surgery. And I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. The final uh, question was, can the test be used to diagnose incomplete myectomy or the presence of a second belly? I'm showing you now a, a series of five consecutive cases of patients in whom we found two bellies at the time of surgery. And this is the first step was the change in free freedom after the myectomy, and then the subsequent change after the myotomy of the posterior, usually smaller belly. You can see that after myectomy, these numbers actually overlap significantly with the patients who had single bellies as well. So even though you could see a change in some of these patients after the severing of the second belly, in fact, these changes, the total changes before or after the second um, myotomy uh, didn't really um, show any significant change from patients who had single bellies. So in terms of answering these study questions and the application of this test at the time of surgery, first of all, the test is strongly and negatively correlated with the preoperative inferior oblique grading. So the more the overaction, the less the torsion freedom. Secondly, overacting inferior obliques are indeed stiffer than control muscles. And if you're doing a myectomy, you should improve the intorsion freedom at least one hour. That also applies to severing the muscle before you do whatever you wish to do with the muscle, if any other procedure. You should get at least one clock hour freedom. And we're now doing this with the Mendez ring, which uh, Jonathan Holmes introduced. So you would expect at least 30 degrees of torsion improvement or relaxing after these procedures. However, because you can't necessarily guarantee that the test will tell you whether or not there's a second belly or missed part of the muscle, there really is no substitute, and this is the most important thing for the trainees out there, is that there is no substitute for checking the inferior temporal quadrant after a myectomy, and this is still the gold standard to be sure that there's no residual fibers uh, uh, or a second or third belly. I'd like to thank my uh, Turkish colleagues for the uh, invitation and for IPOSC for inviting me and for all of you out there who are watching this live or who'll be watching it on tape. And for those of you even beyond, if you are Klingons or Romulans or Balkans, I hope that you'll all stay well and then we can all prosper. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, I was going to ask about the, the, the inferior oblique and Klingons, but, but I'm going to skip, skip that and, and go to maybe more relevant questions and very briefly. Um, can you predict, um, so depending on the inferior oblique overaction that you're trying to fix, um, do you think that titering uh, the effect or the freedom can give you that effect? And, and that goes into myectomy versus recession or where do you put the inferior oblique and, and have you ever seen uh, much of uh, interaction with that or do you ever use that to titer uh, the success of the surgery that you were trying to achieve? Um, no, I, I think um, when I do inferior oblique procedures, they're fairly all or none type procedures. So um, if I do myectomy, I'm doing a fairly standard 10 millimeter myectomy. If I'm anteriorizing it, I put it at a specific spot relative to the inferior rectus insertion or double marginal myotomies. I, I find that uh, um, I, I'm just using the test basically to try and determine whether I feel that I've got the entire muscle isolated and freed, uh, but I don't use it to titrate the uh, end of the surgery kind of final positions or not because uh, you'll find that the torsion test is actually fairly consistent among different procedures when you're reattaching the muscle. And it's very hard to separate out any fineness to the uh, actual result that you're getting with different, let's say different recessions or different positions of anteriorization. So I don't find it's that useful at the end of the test, but it's fairly useful to know whether or not you've 
as I say, you get at least 30 degrees freedom if you've actually detached the muscle successfully and not missed any bellies. Thank you. Uh, what about recessions? Uh, do they also increase torsion freedom? Um, at the time that you detach the muscle is when I actually do the test and you should get at least, what, let's say 30 degrees or more of freedom at that point. When you put the muscle back, it will depend on what the preoperative freedom was. So the more the overaction, the tighter is the muscle. And when you put it back, uh, you'd expect a little more restriction or a little less freedom, the more the muscle was tight at the beginning. But I don't use that, as I mentioned, I don't use that as a fine grading of the final result, but uh, I would expect that you would find uh, the more the overaction was at the beginning, uh, the tighter it will be when you reattach the muscle at the end. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I guess we have to move on. And uh, we have our last speaker, uh, Dr. Cumhur Şener uh, from Ankara, Turkey. And uh, Cumhur is a professor of ophthalmology and he is uh, the pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus. He worked in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus department in Hacettepe University for about 20 years. And now he's in his uh, private clinic and he's also past president of the Turkish Ophthalmological Association, Strabismological Society. And he will talk about superior or inferior transposition in Duane syndrome. We are listening to you, Cumhur. Um, good day. Thank you very much for the invitation to be a part of this exciting meeting. I was asked to give a talk about our experience of applying inferior or superior rectus transposition for the Isodoin syndrome. I would like to acknowledge my coworker, Dr. Pinar Topçu Yilmaz for her hard work in putting together our data. ET doing cases, the classical approach is recessing the medial rectus. Uh, this will move the binocular single visual field close to the primary position, but may limit the abduction and it has no contribution to abduction. It is usually insufficient alone for larger than 15 prism diopters. And if there is an associated lateral rectus abnormal innervation due to the limitation of the abduction caused by the medial rectus recession, there would be increased co-contraction of the lateral rectus and causing an exotropia at the contralateral gaze. Because of these reasons, vertical rectus transposition, VRT, can be preferred over medial rectus recession, and ERT can be applied as mono, either superior or inferior, or dual, two muscles at a time. This case complains about a left head turn of 25 degrees. She shows a clear A pattern isotropia, and as can be seen here, and her ductions towards left up gaze is more compromised for towards left down gaze. We chose to do left superior rectus lateral transposition with three millimeter resection and ciliary vessel sparing. The surgery alone gave us corrections of 15 prism diopters isotropy at the primary position and 20 degrees of the head turn and 10 prism diopters of the A pattern. The second case was admitted with left head turn of also 25, prism, uh, 25 degrees, and she had a clear V pattern isotropia, uh, at, as can be seen in these pictures. And this blue column shows that productions towards left is a bit more compromised in down gaze compared to up gaze. We did a left inferior rectus letter transposition with two millimeter resection and ciliary vessel sparing. We chose to add medial rectus recession of three millimeters with a modified loose loop technique because of the large primary position deviation. The surgery gave us corrections of third prism diopters of isotropy at the primary position and 25 degrees of the head posture and 20 prism diopters of the V pattern. 
The first video is a superior rectus and the second video is an inferior rectus transposition. We like to start the surgery with the dissection of the major vessel pack about five millimeters behind the insertion. We need to pay more attention once the dissection carried closer to the insertion. Uh, there is a network of minor branches at this location and they are prone to be ruptured. The combination of resection to the transposed uh, rectus actually helps us in avoiding the insertion and the network of minor vessels. Doing cases may end up with multiple surgeries along lifetime because they may start asking for more, even if the primary position deviation and post head posture had been reasonably addressed. For this reason, we always give a chance for ciliary vessel sparing. The resected proximal end is translated along the till lobe towards the lateral rectus. The nasal end is sutured at the temporal insertion side of the superior rectus, and the temporal end next to the lateral rectus superior insertion. The stump may be left alone or shaved. We can see here the integrity of the vessels. as can be shown here. And a third suture can be passed at the center in order to prevent a C-shaped central sagging in the form of a semi-adjustable if needed. Oops, sorry. Our data had been published in 2019. However, I would like to share with you our most recent updated data as indicated with the red figures. There are 25 consecutive cases of isotropic duanes. Nine of them had either a significant knee pattern or better abduction towards superior gaze compared to inferior gaze. This group makes about one third of the cases. We did inferior rectus transposition for these cases. Eight patients from the remaining group had a pattern or better abduction at down gaze compared to up gaze, which is about again one third of the cases. And the remaining one third of the cases did not have any significant pattern deviation or abduction difference along the vertical gaze. We did superior rectus transposition for the latter two case groups. This is the updated chart of the outcome, which shows significant effect in all groups on the amount of pattern, primary position deviation, head turn, and contribution to abduction along the vertical case. We were able to achieve less than 10 percent diopters of isotropy at the primary position in about 70% of the cases in each group. Induced torsion was evident in some cases on the table. However, that was not an issue postoperatively. There was one case of induced vertical deviation in the superior rectus transposition group, and the same case had consecutive exotropia. I will shortly present this case. The second case of consecutive exotropia was in the inferior rectus transposition group. This case did not need a correction. None of the cases showed signs of anterior segment ischemia. We do not have a comparative data for the following list of surgeries. We basically do not apply posterior fixation of any kind for augmentation purposes in Duane's. We reserve the dual simultaneous vertical rectus transposition for complete six nerve paralysis. We do not prefer to use hemi or split vertical rectus transposition with the concern of creating larger area of scar tissue, which can be bothersome for revisions. And also we are not yet that clear about the long-term dose response of the Nishida modifications. This case is the overcorrected superior rectus transposition with medial rectus recession. She received three units of Botox for residual 15 prism diopters uh, at the primary position isotropia at three months postoperatively. She was orthotropia at the first postoperative year. However, she developed reversal of the head turn three years later. We had to recess the transpose superior rectus and advanced the medial rectus, which achieved a good result until now. The right case preoperatively is shown on the yellow column and postoperatively on the green column. She developed limitation of adduction together with the development of retraction and up and down shoots. This is her traction and spring back tests at the second surgery. Spare rectus transposition caused a significant positive traction the kind of transposition that we are employing is obviously a restrictive and powerful surgery. 
Unfortunately, this negative effect becomes evident long after the initial surgery. This condition may raise questions about the validity of papers which are reporting early outcome measures. In fact, our index case of a successful inferior rectus transposition on a V-pattern Möbius was published in one of the major textbooks with about only one year follow-up. And unfortunately, that case turned out to be an overcorrection after five years of follow-up. This is the revision surgery of the overcorrected case. It demonstrates the insertion site of the transposed superior rectus with resection. We recommend to approach the superior rectus from the nasal side because the lateral rectus and superior rectus intersection is scarred and superior rectus distal pathway is very close to the lateral rectus. Therefore, the lateral rectus needs to be identified approaching from behind and superior rectus can be uneventfully disinserted and recessed as needed. And the traction test is relieved following the advancement of the medial rectus and the recession of the transposed and resected superior rectus. The lateral rectus and superior rectus intersection, uh, sorry. Uh, the blue column shows the primary position two years following the second procedure. With the surgery, it was possible to address the induced vertical and horizontal deviations simultaneously at the primary position. The right case has been much better and most interestingly, the retraction and the up and down shoots disappeared without the need of a wide split of the lateral rectus. This finding is very important to support the mechanical hypothesis upon the shoots. The range of left gaze has increased and the span of binocular single visual field has also increased with this set of approach. In order to sum up, our first choice is monovertical rectus transposition superior rectus transposition for A pattern or no pattern, inferior rectus transposition for B pattern. Monovertical rectus transposition combined with resection is helpful for ciliary vessel sparing at the insertion and that can replace the need for posterior fixation augmentation. The dose can be adjusted by the amount of resection. I would keep that at most up to three and a half millimeters. It's a very powerful and restrictive surgery. Medial rectus recession or Botox may follow at another stage and with smaller doses. Thank you. Beautiful surgery, Jumhur, as always, and, and it's so informative. And, 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 and um, do you think that compartmentalization has uh, much of an effect? And have you looked at um, maybe different imaging um, um, in, in these patients as well, uh, or is it a very independent factor? Uh, well, these are, these are quite straightforward cases, uh, consecutive cases of isotropic uh, doings. Uh, I, I basically do not uh, tend to image uh, straightforward cases. Uh, other than the kind of cases that uh, that Sehan has already shared with us. Jumur, is there, uh, is there an algorithm that uh, you use? I mean, for like primary iso, this uh, amount of isotropia, I do this type or re add recession or not add recession. Do you have any uh, recommendation for the participants? Yes, well, I would say that uh, the issue is uh, being in the practice for more than uh, 20 years, about 30 years already, you, we end up seeing these patients in later adulthood and they, they, they start to complain about other things like retraction or consecutive deviations and so on. So I, my main goal is to be able to save as much ciliary circulation as possible. Uh, the second thing is, it is... A very straightforward procedure it takes in only about five minutes additional time with the microscope uh, to say the ciliaries. And the most risky part is the insertion part. So in order to facilitate the ciliary vessel sparing, I resect the stump. I resect the, I make the, I add the resection and, and adjusting the amount of resection as Stephen Kraft has nicely shown us with this paper. Uh, can be uh, applied. Uh, I have tried that up to five millimeters. That caused problems to me. 
uh, in terms of giving torsion and vertical uh, unwanted vertical uh, misalignments. But if you keep it until three and a half, if you do it less than that, about let's say one and a half or two millimeters, I, I don't have a solid answer to that. But for the six nerve paralysis cases, if I see a vertical imbalance, I can easily do, let's say, three and a half resection to the superior rectus versus two and a half resection to inferior rectus, which can balance the hyper, hypertrophia. So basically, for a 15 prism diopters of isotropia at the primary position, I'm talking about primary deviation, uh, about three millimeters of resection will do the thing. I don't do medial rectus resections at all. The, the thing that is, that, is, that is totally different of my classical teaching is about the traction test. Even I, if I feel the traction test is positive with the medial rectus, I don't tend to touch it. The first step is the superior rectus or the inferior rectus transposition. The, the, the superior rectus transposition, I tend to separate it from the superior oblique attachments and the inferior rectus transposition, I, I try my best to separate it from the lead retractors. That's why you saw the inferior rectus transposition video in a more pink way than the superior rectus one. So if this is not enough, and I would say, let's say the patient is third prism diopters of isotropia, I would go with the medial rectus recession, but to have much less dose than the usual. And I would definitely look for the scleral bands, as Sehan has pointed out. Uh, in exo, exo duanes, it's a must. There is a there is almost definitely a band there uh, behind the muscle. But for iso duanes, it's not usually the case. Thank you so uh, much, Omar. and and I'm going to actually at this point uh, ask all the panel members to to, to uh, come live and, and see if the EU had any final comments about uh, any of the talks today. May I have a question, uh, Farouk, for, uh, for Michael, actually. Sure. Uh, Michael, uh, I'd like to ask uh, your consideration about, the, um, about inducing intractable diplopia with the use of a binocular treatment, especially in strabismic amblyops. So uh, we know that there are some reported cases, but what is your feeling about this, especially for the use of uh, this method in um, older ages? Um, and I guess the easy answer is we don't know, other than to say that we've worried about intractable diplopia with amblyopia treatment since our very first study launched and have looked at that in every one of the studies that we've had um, older children or teenagers involved and just have had essentially no one that was really symptomatic in a harmful fashion. There were some children that did have new diplopia or increased frequency diplopia, uh, but the number is really small. I would say, I don't know, Sehan, about what's gonna happen with some of these other new strategies, um, but. I worry that the concern about intractable diplopia may be um, a little bit of bias of the case reporting, that the denominators of all the treatments were huge, and you know we typically will report our bad outcomes. Um, but I'd say the trials haven't shown it to be a big concern. Thank you. Because of the sake of time, while well, we are kind of closing the before we close the session, and I just uh, would like to personally um, thank all the organizers, speakers, and and my lovely moderator, and and the, and leave it up to to Huvan to to close the session. Thank you. All. Before closing, first of all, I would like to thank uh, for the organization, for IPOSC and American Academy for hosting this uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to thank. Um, Dan and Michael for their support and all the uh, staff for technical staff for their hidden support and efforts for today's webinar. I would like to thank our participants for being with us for attending this webinar today. And I would like to give microphone to uh, Jason, the uh, teaching and educating committee uh, 
And I would like to thank them once again with Sonal and Jason uh, for organizing this uh, webinar today. Thanks a lot and have a good day. And I'm leaving the thank microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, thank you for joining this uh, wonderful webinar. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce, to announce our next webinar for next month. This time is joining with uh, South Korea uh, colleagues from the KPOS, the Korean uh, Association for Pediatric and uh, 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 Strabismus Society. So uh, we will have, uh, it, it will be on February 20th, uh, Sunday, uh, uh, 8 a.m. EDT. So we will have uh, Miho Sato from IPOS and Choming Wang from KPOS to moderate for us. It will be on a very interesting and important topic, the intermittent esotropia. We will cover various topics from the use of over minus spectacles uh, by uh, uh, Donnie Song from USA, and also the use of Botox in the management of IST by Rosario uh, uh, Gomez de Neno from Spain, and Emma's application in intermittent XT from uh, uh, Hai Jin Lee from uh, South Korea, and the trend of IST in Japan, uh, from Miho Sato from Japan, and also the intermittent esotropia with conversion insufficiency from Dr. Po Yong Chong from South Korea, and consecutive esotropia after intermittent esotropia operation by Su Lin uh, Ryu from, uh, Ryu from uh, South Korea. So please join uh, us uh, for our next webinar on intermittent esotropia on fe uh, February 20th uh, next month. Thank you very much uh, for all your uh, joining us. Thank you. So uh, let's uh, for us, uh, we shall have the time for a uh, group picture now. Um, just a moment. Stop share. So please, uh, uh, um, Daniel, can you show off uh, your video also? Yes, uh, let's uh, have a group picture. Let's uh, all... Um, there's too many comments coming out from the box. <laughs> uh, let's wait a moment first. Otherwise, uh, it will. Okay. We... Okay. Um... No. One, two, three. Okay. I've taken mine. Um, so, Farouk, anything to say? From you. I think, uh, thank, thank okay. you all. It was a fantastic, informative webinar. Thank you all. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dan. Oh, Thanks. Let's hope we can do this in person soon. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Hopefully, Hopefully in April. Want to be, yeah, want to see people live. Thank you very uh, much. Bye. Yeah.